Hello everyone, welcome to the Bare Bones Pilgrim TED Talk. My name is Pastor Kim and I'm so happy to be sharing with you today. I was blessed to be able to be raised right next to a historical site, the Plymouth Plantation. I spent many hours in Plymouth and was fascinated by the history of the pilgrims and the natives that I went out and bought the books and I did the research and I became a school and historical interpreter. I would bring my TED Talk to the children to help them understand the difference between myths and legends and the truths about these fascinating people. Many of the pilgrims were buried in my hometown cemetery, so we were quite aware growing up of the subculture that had been there before us. But let's start at the beginning, shall we? How did the pilgrims get to the New World? Well, England was a Roman Catholic nation until 1534, when King Henry VIII declared himself the head of a new national church called the Church of England. A lot of people were not happy about this change. They thought it would be very different from Catholicism, but it didn't turn out to be. And some of the people wanted a simpler church like the early Christians had. And they wanted to purify the church to the times of Paul. So they became what we called Puritans. Another group that was considered really radical went even further. They didn't think of this new Church of England would work at all. So they wanted to separate from the church and form a brand new church. They were called separatists. But you know what? In the early 1600s in England, that was dangerous because it was illegal to be part of any church other than the Church of England. Some of them had been fined and even sent to jail for practicing their faith. When they felt they were no longer able to practice safely in England, they chose to flee to the Dutch Netherlands. And there were not very many people, just a small group, a small congregation. When they were in Holland, they could practice their own religion without fear of persecution from the English government or its church. Now these separatists thought it might be easier in Holland with some religious freedom for them. But you know what? Life was not easy in the Netherlands. The separatists had to leave their homeland and, and the friends and some of their family and live in a foreign country with no clear idea of how they would support themselves. Now the congregation stayed briefly in Amsterdam and then moved to the city of Leiden. They stayed there for the next 11 to 12 years. Most found work in cloth trades, while others were carpenters or, or tailors or some were printers. Their lives required a lot of hard work. Even young children had to work. But some of the older children, well, they were tempted by the Dutch culture and they left their families to become soldiers and sailors. Their parents started to fear that they would lose their identity as English people. And to make matters worse, the congregation worried that another war could break out between the Dutch and the Spanish. So they decided to move again. And this is where we hear about the other ship and the Mayflower and the move to America. After careful thought, the congregation decided to leave Holland to establish a farming village in the north part of the Virginia colony. At that time, it was about 1620. Now, Virginia extended from Jamestown, Virginia in the south to the mouth of the Hudson River in the north. That was how big Virginia was, almost to New York. So the Pilgrims planned to settle near present-day New York City. And when they arrived there, they really hoped to live under English rule, but they would worship in their own separate church. But friends, they had little money, and you need money to make a journey like this. So they entered into an agreement with financial investors called the Virginia Company. And the company would provide passage for the colonists and then supply them with tools and clothing and supplies. But then, the colonists would have to work for the company to pay off their debt as basically indentured servants. And they would send back to England some natural resources like fish and timber and furs. All of their assets, including the land and the pilgrims' houses, would belong to the company until the end of seven years, when all of it would be divided among each of the investors and colonists. The colonists and investors had a lot of arguments about this, but eventually the pilgrims were able to leave Europe for America. Now that's not what we learned in the history books, is it? It's not what we learned in our schools and our churches. It isn't. We learned that everyone that went there was free and they were trying to escape and be able to be free to practice a religion. There's a lot more to it than that. They weren't really indentured servants. And the entire congregation could not come to America together. Only those who could settle their affairs quickly went first, while the greater number of the congregation, including the pastor, John Robinson, remained behind. The congregation purchased a very small ship called the Speedwell 
to transport them across the sea, and they were going to keep the ship to use it for fishing and trading in America. It was small. Now at Southampton, a port in England, they were joined by a group of English colonists who'd been gathered by the investors. Another group of people went with them. They were not separatists. They were merchants and farmers and indentured servants. So the group that made it to the New World wasn't just those separatists. The Speedwell and the Mayflower, another ship rented by the investors, left for America together. After twice turning back to England because the Speedwell was leaking, they were forced to leave the Speedwell ship behind. And because of this disaster, more families were divided when some passengers had to be left behind because there wasn't enough space. A month after leaving England on September 6, 1620, the Mayflower set out alone with 102 passengers, 50 men, 20 women, 32 children, and some dogs, and some cats, and some chickens, and possibly pigs crowded into a ship the size of a modern day tugboat. Yes, it really was that small. I have been on the replica many, many times, and I have gone down into the hull to sit and lay in a hammock where they were, and let me tell you, friends, it was packed tight. Let's look at a few pictures of the Mayflower, shall we? Here are two pictures over here of the outside of the Mayflower. This is a replica, and it was a fascinating ship, but you can see kind of how small it was. It was not very large at all. Now they had aimed for New York, and a storm blew them off course. They ended up on the shores of then extended Virginia, what we know now as the neck of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, near Provincetown. While they were anchored there, the people wrote and signed something called the Mayflower Compact. This was the first document of its kind in the New World, and it described what type of government would rule the people. But friends, there was a problem. It was almost winter. They had endured living in very tight quarters with seasickness and illnesses. They had barely survived. They needed food and shelter quickly. So here's a picture right here of what they did next. Some of the men ventured out in this long boat. See this long boat here? They called them long boats. They ventured out on November 11, 1620, and they stumbled onto an Indian grave site where they found baskets of corn as offering to the dead. They took the corn and they made the natives of the area very, very angry. They were shot at, but it didn't stop the men because they were starving and they didn't understand the culture of the natives. Because it didn't look like a friendly place to settle, they upped anchor. They moved a bit more up the neck of the Cape to settle at New Plymouth in a long deserted site of the Wampanoag village. It was December 16, 1620. It was chilly, my friends, in Massachusetts. It was chilly. I used to live there. It was cold. On December 25th, Christmas Day, they started to build a shelter, a meeting house, a common house to keep them together and keep out the cold. It was finished on January 9, but friends, it was too late. Of the 102 who traveled on the Mayflower, only 52 survived that winter, 52. Let's look at what happened next. Well, they had to build houses, didn't they? Let's look at a few pictures. This is an old fashioned TED Talk, friends. Let's look at some pictures of them building houses. And you can notice that there are no nails anywhere, none at all. They had to take each timber and cut it individually. They had a big long saw that they could go up and down with, and two men could be on it at once. It was a very hard job to do. The grounds had been measured out for 19 home sites in New Plymouth. The bachelors would live with other families until they could afford a home of their own and a wife. Now let's look at what the houses might have looked like. Aren't these pictures wonderful? These pictures are courtesy of the Plymouth Plantation. Aren't those interesting pictures? And do you see the oven in the middle there? The oven. They had to cook their bread and things outside because they couldn't dare have it inside the house. What would catch on fire? See over here? 
where my finger is? That's called thatching. And so there's thatching on the roof, which is basically straw. And if it had that kind of an oven inside, it could catch this on fire. So he moved all the ovens outside. Let's look at what could have been inside. I'm going to collect these pictures. I thought that we call this an old-fashioned TED Talk, friends. Let's look at this. Can you see this gentleman writing? He was actually kind of wealthy because he actually had a candlestick and a vase, and he had a writing quill, and he had some ink, and he had actual paper book. So he had some money. He could have been one of the governors. And look behind him, though. See how sparse things were. Very few things to eat off of. Usually they shared a common bowl. It was very sparse. Now let's look at how they kept warm. That's important. Look at the clothing they wore. aren't what we're used to seeing pilgrims be in, are they? Not at all. In fact, where's the black and white? Where's the buckles? Where's the funny hats that the men wore that were black and white with the big buckle on the front? That is so interesting. Do you remember seeing children in grade school with those costumes on? I'm going to give you a picture here. It's a small one. I'm going to hold it up for you, Arnie. My photographer Arnie is here with me. Can you see this one? That's what we're used to seeing in grade school. That was me when I was a child and I was in a parade. And that's what I wore. And it was wonderful. But that is not what the Pilgrims wore, friends. I'm going to remove this now. How did we ever get the idea that Pilgrims wore these clothes? I mean, where did that come from? Look at the beautiful colors. It came from this, my friends. This picture. This was a picture called the, it's from 1867, and it's originally called the Early Puritans of New England Going to Church. That it was just changed to simply Pilgrims Going to Church. This painting from 1867 was painted by George Henry Bowton. All of our impressions of the Pilgrims came from this made up painting. Isn't that unbelievable? So then a hundred years later, after doing research and archeological digs, we discovered that the pilgrims wore brighter clothing with no buckles at all, but they did have buttons. Kind of amazing that we kind of lived into that myth for so long, wasn't it? I happen to like the beautiful colors. They use natural dyes to, to dye the, the clothing and the, and the wool. I'm going to change pictures now for a minute. Let's look at how they would have grown food and how they gathered food. Well, first they hunted. They did some hunting. They learned how to hunt. And they gardened. You see, we have a complete list of what they carried with them on the Mayflower. So we know they had tools for farming, they had some seeds and some animals. And in the beginning, though, they were cold and hungry and not used to the soil of this new land. The picture of this that you've seen today, they're from the year 1627, seven years after they landed. So let's think back when they first landed. Well, they knew that the natives were nearby. It was about January when they had their first house, right? They didn't speak with the natives until March. And a man named Samoset entered their village and was able to speak to them in English. He had learned it from a fisherman. He introduced them to another native named Squanto. You've probably heard of him in your, in your books. Squanto had been captured by the English and sold into slavery. He escaped years later and came back to his home to find that every single person was dead from an English disease. The pilgrims that had come had settled onto his tribe's land. So he decided to help them. Let me show you some more pictures. He decided to show them the most important thing they could have ever learned. 
He showed them how to plant corn the native way like these girls are doing here, with a hill. And then you took three fish and you placed it around it for fertilizer. He also showed them how to hunt and fish and survive. And we know that that first summer, they planted corn and peas and barley, but the corn, because of the natives, it did the best. Squando also introduced them to Massasoit, the chief of the Wampanoag tribe. The pilgrims agreed on a peace treaty. There were the natives and the both groups promised to help each other, which they did for a while. The pilgrims had to preserve their food though, right? Because there was no refrigeration. And the best way to do this, my friends, are three ways. There are three ways. What do you think they are? You can see them right there, right? They had to salt their food heavily, which dries it out, or they had to dry it in the sun or to smoke it. And here's a picture of them preserving their food. She's actually doing a ham right there. This was in the year 1627, so they had pigs by then. And you can see behind them, there's the ham there that she has salted already but she's putting it in literally a vat of salt and rubbing it and rubbing it and then they hang it to dry. Now because the first harvest was so good, particularly the corn, the governor of the new colony, Governor Bradford, decided that they would show that they were thankful to God for the harvest, so they held a celebration similar to the harvest festivals that were held in England. Ninety members of the Wampanoag tribe came to the festival, ninety members, and friends, it lasted for three days. They had to really have a time of celebration, but know that the natives too, it was part of their routine and their tradition to uh, the harvest time to also have a celebration of the harvest. But friends, there was no turkey, no pumpkin pie, and no cranberries. The wild cranberries were too bitter to eat without sugar. In fact, when I was a child, I was raised near cranberry bogs. And the most wonderful memory that I have is ice skating on the cranberry bogs that were flooded. I chip my end of my blade of the ice, of, onto the ice, and I chip it and chip it, use my blade in that. And I dig down, and I get a handful of cranberries that were frozen, and you pop them in your mouth. And I'm telling you that it was like 20 degrees out, and it was sharp and beautiful and wonderful. And the wild cranberries, they couldn't use because they didn't have any sugar. They were really, really, really bitter. But what they did eat was cod and sea bass and wild birds and cornmeal and five deer brought by the natives. And that is the celebration that our Thanksgiving takes after. It's morphed a little bit, hasn't it? Let me show you a picture of what it would have been like then. This is a replica of what the actual Thanksgiving at that time would have looked like. And they didn't call it Thanksgiving. It was a, a feast, the harvest feast. And can you see the natives have joined them at the table? They're eating corn, and lobster, and mussels, and cakes, corn cakes, and deer, venison. They would not have had turkey at that time. The festival, this whole thing, it was three days long. And during the three days, they had a lot of fun. And this is recorded, by the way, in William Bradford's book. So I've read his book, and I know what they did. And they recorded all the fun times they had for three days. The natives showed them how to do their games. There were lots and lots of different kinds of games. They played games for days and ate lots and lots of venison. And the children also, the pilgrim children, showed their games. And they had some from England that they remembered. So it was quite a celebration. They generally made merry. Over the next six years, more English colonists arrived. And many of the people who had stayed behind in England or Holland when when the Mayflower left, were able now to join their families. By 1627, the Plymouth colony was stable and pretty comfortable. Harvests were good and families were growing. In 1627, about 160 people lived in the Plymouth colony that you've seen today. The pictures were from that time period. Now, here's a good question. Why do we call them pilgrims? Well, a pilgrim is a person who goes on a long journey, often with a religious or a moral purpose and especially to a foreign land. After the Mayflower arrived, the first baby was born. It was a boy, and his parents, William and Susanna White, named him Peregrine. That's a word which means traveling from far away and also means pilgrim. 
Then the writer of Mort's Relation in 1622 refers to the Plymouth colonists as pilgrims. Governor William Bradford calls the Plymouth settlers pilgrims when he writes about their departure from Leiden, Holland to come to America. They knew they were pilgrims and looked not much on those things, but lifted up their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. Now, let's talk about the Native Americans. There's been quite a bit of controversy surrounding Thanksgiving in the Plymouth area today. And so many, many natives are not happy with the idea that Native Americans should be grateful for the events that led to their suffering. They lost their land to the pilgrims and Squanto lost his entire tribe to a European disease. In 1600, there were as many as 12,000 Wampanoag people with at least 40 villages divided between 8,000 people on the mainland another 4,000 offshore on the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. When the Pilgrims landed in 1620, fewer than 2,000 mainland Wampanoag had survived, 2,000 left. And after the English settlement of Massachusetts, in 1675, only 1,000 were left. Each year, a national day of mourning takes place on Thanksgiving, and it's sponsored by the United American Indians of New England. It began in 1970, and it's a way for the Native people to memorialize the indigenous people who died as a result of colonization. It's also to protest and protest against discrimination of their people. The idea that the pilgrims and the Indians had this feast and then decided to live heavily, happily ever after just really isn't true. After 1630, the original 50 pilgrims that had survived and the ones that had arrived on ships between 1621 and 1630 had been absorbed by the massive migration of the Puritans of the New England Massachusetts Bay Colony of Boston. The attitude to the natives changed and it became unfriendly and not one of cooperation. By 1637, the colonies expanded and destroyed a powerful native confederacy that had opposed them. And by 1665, the Native Americans in Southern New England were in the way and the English no longer needed their skills in hunting and fishing and gardening. Epidemic after epidemic hit the population. They were reduced substantially in size and in health, and there was fighting. When I was growing up, I was really familiar with the Wampanoag. As the tribe is still there, and at the Plymouth Plantation, there's a separate area for the tribe to teach the visitors. And unlike the other parts of the plantation, where the people in the English part stay in character, like if you walked up to someone in an English character in the 1627 village and said, excuse me, ma'am, Where's the closest McDonald's? She'd say, oh, McDonald's, they're down the road a piece. They stayed in character, but quite the opposite in the village next door of the Wampanoag tribe. They are originally descended from the Wampanoags, but they're there to teach us about what life would have been like. Let's look at some pictures, shall we? This is a Witu. It's a house. This is a mushroom. That's a canoe. My girls actually participated in creating a canoe like this. You put um, fire inside the middle of a log and you burn it out and etch it and etch it. It takes many, many days to create a, a dugout canoe. And my girls participated in helping with that. This is a fun one, friends. This is a scarecrow. That is actually called a scarecrow. And it's a, it's, a, it's a little building. It sits pretty high up, about 10 feet, maybe 11, 12 feet. And the children go in there, and they scare the crows from the fields. Isn't that amazing? And here's another one that I love here. These are ladies tanning a hide because they did use the skins, particularly of the deer. And they would take the animal's brains of the deer because you waste nothing. And they would soak the skins in the brains and water. And the acid in the brain takes off any additional sinew. And the leather is cured and very, very soft. Isn't that fascinating? So much has changed since this time, friends. So much has changed. Today, the Wampanoag have grown to a membership of 3,000 ancestors. Many survived on the islands without being killed. And now, 
The Wampanoags are relearning their lost language, and the children are learning the language in school. So much has changed since this time. Friends, when you settle into your Thanksgiving meal this year, think about the original settlers and the natives that supported them that first winter. I encourage you to remember with honor the hard work the pilgrims put in and the honorable way the Wampanoags supported them. And when I finish here, don't leave, because all the pictures will be there after me for you to see again, because they're wonderful pictures taken by Plymouth Plantation. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everyone. One iuk, be well. Thank mm -hmm. you.